Good morning, Faith Church. Good to see everybody. Nice to see your smiling eyes this morning. <laughs> well, uh, let's remember who we are, Faith Church, our mission. Let's uh, look up on the screen. Our mission is to express God's love to all, invite others to know Jesus, and make faithful disciples. Well, this morning I thought, like, coming back for the first time, why make it easy? So there's a few little tech changes that uh, you'll, you'll notice are taking place this morning. Um, there are things that are kind of moving us forward into the way that ultimately we'd like to have our live stream. So I know that um, uh, you who were sitting here uh, before, uh, when we had uh, the, the screen on, you would see me about one second in the past. And so you won't be seeing that anymore. So we got rid of that. So that hopefully that distraction will be gone. And then we'll have a little bit more up here like we used to uh, with uh, the scriptures, the words for songs and things like that. So we'll be working on that today. Ultimately, we're getting it to a place where when we have Hazel here live and playing music, we've got the words up on the screen here. You can see them here. You can see them at home. And we just have to wrap our head around and, and get uh, the new way of doing it. So you may notice nothing or you may notice some hiccups. Um, I'm noticing it just because we're doing it for the first time, but eventually that'll become second nature too. So it's good to be back. It's good to be back. And it was, um, I want to thank you so much for your support and uh, giving me a chance to kind of reset and uh, keep us going. Uh, strong here at Faith Church, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, more when our sermon comes up uh, later today. So if you will, remember to silence your mobile devices to help us in our worship experience here this morning, and let's remember to continue, no matter what the circumstances are in our personal lives or our communal lives, we can always invite people to faith. We can always share the good things that are going on in our lives uh, with people around us, and if we open ourselves to see opportunities when they present themselves, they will present themselves, and uh, we'll have a chance to share our faith uh, with others. Uh, as you can see, Hazel's uh, not here this morning. She is traveling. She's uh, with family, and so uh, she hasn't had a chance to do that uh, for over a year and a half, and so she's uh, uh, doing that uh, this weekend and probably next weekend and then we'll have her back and me back we'll all be live and um, you know and uh, as long as nothing changes in the world which you know how that goes <laughs> all right why don't we all stand together as we uh, enter into God's gates with thanksgiving and praise this morning with our opening song
Amen. You may be seated. Well, it's now time for our kids and faith kids and youth. Uh, Good to see you guys here this morning. And uh, we will be looking at a video up on the screen. Uh, How many of you have seen sheep throughout the scriptures? I think from the very beginning in Genesis, all throughout the Bible. And uh, sheep are still around today. They're a pretty important part of life. So let's see uh, what our video is here this morning. Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of the Totally Kids Show. Today, we're going to be hanging out and learning about some cute little guys that have been around for a long time. They've been around for so long, they were there when Jesus was born. Today, we're going to be learning about sheep. This is Jeff and Teresa. They own this ranch here. Thank you guys so much for having us. You're welcome. We're glad you're here. So tell us, what part of the ranch are we in right now? Well, we're actually in one of our corrals where we keep our lambs. We have a group of ewe lambs. We have a group of ram lambs. Sheep are amazing. There are over 1 billion sheep in the world and over 900 different species. Sheep are smart and can recognize their friends in a big herd and their shepherd. They come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. Adult males are called rams. Adult females are called the ewes. Babies are called lambs. The breed here is Rambolet. Hey Gunner, what do you call the quietest farm animal? I don't know. A sheep. So how long have sheep been around? Sheep have been around for thousands and thousands of years. I'm sure you've looked in the Bible and seen they were in Jesus' time. In fact, they're mentioned in the Bible 500 times. That's a lot. So I see you have a dog here. How does your dog help you with the sheep? Well, our dog is a great help because he's a border collie and border collies are born with the innate ability to herd sheep. So what we did is we taught him a few different commands and he now goes out and helps us bring sheep in, put them in pens. He is such a good help. He would rather work the sheep than eat or do anything else. Would you like to see him work? Oh yeah, that'd be awesome. All right, we'll go put him to work. Walk up. Good job. Okay, easy, easy, sit. Good boy. So right now he's getting five sheep that we are gonna weigh. We'll put this guy in. All right. So he's in the scale. So this sheep weighs 151 pounds. Hey Bethany, what do you call a sheep that dances? I don't know. A ballerina. That was a bad joke. She got me there. What we're going to do is we're going to take these wheelbarrows inside, scoop up some manure, put that on the pastures in the winter time so in the spring when we get rains and snow, we'll have fertilizer on the pasture and it will grow real tall for them to eat. So, what's the sheep's names? Well, only a few of the sheep have names if they're very special. Like we have one sheep that is named Panda. We have another one that's called Roly Poly, but the majority of them don't have any name at all. Now, we're gonna bring the sheep out here because they like to come out in this pasture and eat the green grass. Sheep eat grass and other pasture plants. 
they spend about seven hours eating two to four pounds of food each day. So we have some sheep wool here and I would love to teach you how to spin it into yarn. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. You're going to start pulling these fibers apart. Each one of these fibers is hollow like a straw. If you have a wool sweater on, it will keep you warm in the winter and it will keep you cool, believe it or not, in the summer. You're gonna start twisting. Twist, twist, twist. And if you gently pull, look at that. You've made yarn. Thank you guys so much for showing us your awesome ranch. It's been our pleasure. Hope you come back sometime. We always love to have people come. It was so fun. We'll see you next time. On the Totally Kids Show. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> let's pray before kids go to Sunday school. God, we're grateful that you have an amazing creation that we're a part of. And we're glad that you are our shepherd. We love you and thank you for all your gifts. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's sing our song and kids will go on to Sunday school. Now it's time to prepare our hearts for the sermon today, and let's sing together, Give Thanks.
Amen. Let us pray. Unchanging God, you have blessed us forever through the beloved one, Jesus Christ our Lord. Born again by your word of truth, let us live out your love, doing your word, caring for the weak and vulnerable in their distress, and even pursuing your reign of justice. We bring to you today the joys and the concerns of our hearts. We give you thanks for all the gifts that you've given us. We take a moment to lift up those for whom we have made special requests for prayer this week. And we pray for those who are in need of your healing and wholeness. God, we know deep within our hearts that by the power of your loving presence, you are able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. Father of lights, there is no variation or shadow due to change in you. Let your spirit illumine our hearts through your holy word, turning us from the emptiness of our human traditions to the fullness of life in the beloved one, Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, this morning for the sermon, I wanted to start just kind of by catching up with you and uh, sharing with you uh, what uh, life has been like for me uh, on sabbatical. Um, the, uh, the term sabbatical, of course, comes from the same word of Sabbath a weekly time of rest that we see uh, that's given in the scriptures. And one of the first things that we see when God gives the commandment for people, for all of us to take a Sabbath rest, is it's about uh, ceasing to work. Uh, how many of us kind of like that idea of having a chance to cease from work and take a Sabbath? And we all need a chance to kind of, uh, of stop. So that was uh, one of the main things uh, that, uh, that we did uh, during, or that I did during sabbatical. And just like you do for a, a weekly Sabbath or an occasional Sabbath, uh, it's a time to take a break from work, not so that you never work again, but to uh, be refreshed and to reset so that you can continue to do the good work uh, that, uh, that we're all called to. So, uh, a lot, of, a lot of it, when we say that we're ceasing to work, a lot of that means we are, are stopping the same old, same old, the same old routine. There's a lot of same old fill in the blanks that we go through in life. And eventually, uh, as time goes on and we do the same thing over and over again, uh, we need a chance to kind of stop and, and reset uh, because the, it, uh, the routines can be good in our life, but eventually they can become more hollow, not as life-giving and, and not as much any energy producing as uh, they can become uh, draining. So uh, this was another kind of goal in sabbatical is just to reset and to, and to stop doing uh, the same old uh, routine. Now, I, I ended up um, not just stopping working, uh, I really ended up kind of replacing one type of work with another. <laughs> uh, some of that was yard work. Uh, another big thing that happened, you know, of course, just before uh, sabbatical started is we moved from one house to another here locally. And so uh, how many know that there's usually a lot of work that takes quite a bit of time, uh, even after you get into the new place? So uh, there was a lot of work uh, surrounding boxes and other types of things uh, during this time. But it wasn't the same old work, it was kind of a, a, a new type of work that uses a different part of your brain and a different part of energy. And then I had a chance to work on some things that I enjoy working on like we would a hobby. So I've got a motorcycle that I've worked on, I've got the genealogy records for family that I work on. Those are things that I kind of like to do in, the, in my spare time and free time and uh, they're enjoyable types of work. Another thing that I was able to do is to spend some good quality time with my family, uh, which was uh, wonderful. And we had a chance toward the beginning of sabbatical to take a trip together. Uh, I went uh, to New York City for the very first time. Uh, that, again, doesn't necessarily sound like rest, probably, but it is definitely a change from the regular routine and doing something completely different. 
And so for Ian and for me, it was a, a brand new experience. And we had a whole lot of fun going to all the big places in, in New York City for the very first time, experiencing the energy and the vitality of, of this, big, uh, this big city. And what we got there on Monday, and by the time Friday rolled around and it was time to go back home, we were ready to go back home. And it was uh, one of the things that Ian mentioned uh, coming back is that he really had a new appreciation for how green it is in Florida and, uh, and how relaxed and laid back it is. So uh, I don't know about you, but I really like living in a green laid back place. And I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for the world. And got to do some, some other things. I, I used to be a, a big movie buff and would go to the movies every, almost every single weekend and you know, check out the new thing that came out. And for a long time, especially recently, you, know, you get used to staying at home and, and watching from the comfort of your own, uh, of your own place. Uh, but I kind of got back into that with, uh, with my family. So Suli and I used to do that kind of uh, toward the beginning of us getting to know each other, going to movies together. And so things like that uh, got a chance to kind of do some fun things and, and kind of reset. And of course, we, we now live a five minute walk from the beach. So there's been a lot of beach walks, uh, which is just great. Having the sand in your, in your toes and, uh, and just, uh, you know, enjoying the waves and, and nature and things like that. Uh, sabbatical is also a time for reflection and, and meditation on life. And so that is a big part of also what I was uh, working on is uh, d reflecting on life. Now, I'm going to be uh, in November turning 50 years old. And uh, I have heard that uh, this becomes a reflective time in life. Anybody experienced that before? So... Uh, as, as this has been getting closer and closer, that's been coming back into my mind. And um, I fully understand when people talk about midlife crisis, I kind of get it. I understand that in a, in a way that's not just theory anymore, but it's a practical experience. And so some of that reflection is just on, uh, you know, when you get to this uh, point in life, you start thinking about like, you know, what have I done with all these years and uh, what do I have left? And it seems that as we get up in age, the days go faster and the times seem shorter. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a unique uh, place in life to be. And so uh, sabbatical reflection and midlife reflection kind of coincided uh, for me. And uh, part, part of it, of course, is uh, reflecting on careers. And uh, many people do that at midlife. When you hit 50, you think about what you've done with your career. And there's a lot of folks that make a big, uh, a big change. If you go to seminary uh, today, uh, uh, like when I went to seminary in the late 90s, the majority seems to be now second career uh, people that have gone through some type of a career up until some point of midlife and then have made a career change into ministry. And uh, there are a lower percentage of folks that kind of started out in, in ministry. Um, when, I, when I first told my dad that I, was, I wanted to go to seminary and I wanted to go into ministry, he's a pastor himself and had been for a number of years. And the first thing he told me is he says, if there's anything else in life that will bring you fulfillment and enjoyment, do that. But if being a pastor is the only thing that will really give you that sense of you're accomplishing, you know, what you're called for in life, then, then you need to do that as well. So, you know, he, he was uh, very adamant about making sure, you know, take this, this call uh, seriously. And so those, those words that my dad uh, gave to me many years ago, they echoed back as I'm, as I'm reflecting back on life. You know, I think to myself, um, did I heed my dad's warning? Did I thoroughly think things through? Did I follow after uh, what I really should be doing and need to be doing? Uh, and so th those are things that I've been kind of ruminating on and thinking about. They're, they're big things. They're, they're, not, they're not small uh, reflections. Ultimately, uh, what I have found 
uh, as I reflected on, you know, my own personal life and career, and of course also reflecting on what it means to be church, and we can't get away from what it means to be church in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, reflecting on all these things, I have come away from my sabbatical time with uh, this phrase stuck in my mind, and that is double down. I don't know if any of you have seen, there's a movie in the late 90s called Swingers, and these two guys go to Vegas, and they're at the big tables, and, uh, well, they're at the blackjack tables, and uh, they're trying to be cool, and they're trying to look like they know what they're doing, and at one point in the game, the guy decides to double down. Well, it ends up not working out, for him and that becomes his nickname for the rest of the movie is Double Down. Um, But I thought to myself, I'm I'm, I'm ready to do that. As I I reflect back on the direction uh, that I feel like that uh, that I've taken in life and followed, I feel good about it. And I feel like I'm at a place where Uh, you know, even though you go through midlife, even though you reflect on whether or not did did I really make good choices and am I really on the right path, Uh, I've I've come away with a sense of of wanting to to double down and feel secure moving forward. So that is a sense of accomplishment. And if I'm honest with you, going into sabbatical, it wasn't just a typical sabbatical because it had – well, for one, it had uh, over a year of this pandemic and all of its stresses and, and unknowns right on top of everything. So going into this, was a, it was, uh, I was very, very tired and could not think straight and, uh, and really didn't know what the answers were. So it's been a real blessing to kind of get back on track and to reset uh, and, and to... Uh, and to be able to, even though we have challenges in front of us, to be able to say, uh, I'm secure in knowing who I am and who we are as a church, and we can continue forward uh, with God's help uh, and, and feel good about it. Uh, if I'm going to sum up what I've come away with, there is nothing better than living a simple and balanced life. A simple and balanced life. And yes, it's good to have goals and dreams. uh, And yes, it's good to try to do your best. But at the end of the day, I think we'll all be happiest if we can just uh, get a few good, strong priorities straight in our life and try to keep balance. And there's there's a lot within spiritual life that encourages us uh, to do that. A lot of Jesus' teachings talk about balance and Focusing on today and not worrying about the future and, uh, and, and teachings like this. So I'm, I'm hoping that I can hold on to that simple, balanced uh, life directive that I'm coming away with sabbatical and can um, continue to, to move with that into the future. Again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to have this experience. And my, my hope and dream is that uh, you'll experience the benefits of that uh, as uh, I'm uh, sharing with you in ministry here at, at Faith Church. Now, I did mention uh, the global pandemic in, uh, you know, in talking about sabbatical. And yes, uh, I, like I'm sure you are, I am sick and tired of talking about it and listening to about it and thinking about it. I am, <laughs> and I'm sure you are too. However, uh, as a church, uh, as, we're, as we're looking at how we should face life and how God is directing us and with us, uh, we can't simply ignore it. We can't ignore uh, COVID or the or the pandemic or anything like that, and so uh, I, I I I have to as much as I would like to disregard it and ignore it and just not think about it or even pretend it doesn't exist. I, I have to come back to it as as a, a pastor of this church, and I think all of us as responsible people we have to come back to it in a simple and balanced way, not to be obsessed with it or overwhelmed by it. Uh, but it is uh, something that's informing our reality. And I, did, I do uh, want to, because part of my reflection over the past several weeks has gone back to this, and of course the big question of 
not just this local church, but just church in general, how in the world are we going to get through uh, something like this? If you were paying any attention to uh, the way that people talk about church over the past several decades, it hasn't been a lot of positive in terms of uh, looking at the future of the church. A lot of the talk has been, you know, we're seeing declines in numbers. It doesn't play the same role in people's lives as it did before. And so there is kind of, there was kind of this stress and unknown about is the church going to survive this new, this new time in the country that we live in, in the society and the culture that we live in? Is it still going to be important for us? When we throw a pandemic on top of it, it seems like, oh my gosh, we're throwing even more fuel on a fire that was completely out of control. But uh, I think... Like anything else, if we look at the stories and the history of our faith, what we can find is that there have been countless people and generations, uh, different points in time when people have gone through extremely difficult, disheartening, hopeless situations, and they have depended on their relationship with God, and it has gotten them through these times, and they've come out on the other side with a stronger sense of self and a stronger sense of faith that, than before. We've just been going through this, you know, for a year and a half. And we're inconvenienced by things that have changed in our lives. Can you imagine when we're looking at, like, the people of Israel who had their entire lives destroyed and then were taken into captivity for 50, 60, 70 years? That's a type of faith that really had to stand uh, a test of time. We look at the example of Jesus with the disciples and the things that they went through. So people have gone through stuff, and it's their faith that has rooted them and given them life. I know that when we're in the middle of this, uh, COVID is not just about a pandemic. COVID has, uh, for the church has been another chance for us to ask ourselves, what role does science play in our lives? As people of faith, we've wrestled with this uh, question of how does science and faith work together? Are they opposed to one another? Are they compatible with one another? How does that work? We have also this idea of fear. Fear is a huge factor in what we've experienced over the past year and a half. Anybody experience fear? Personal fear, fear for our, for our community, fear for our lives. Fear can be overwhelming. Fear can make us forget what's really important. Fear can become this dominating factor that puts us into this survival mode that is not where we want to live our lives for the long term. And fear has been a big part of it. How does our faith, how, how does that match up with fear? What has the Bible talked to us about fear and about faith? If we look at the example of Jesus, Jesus went through some incredibly fearful and scary uh, times in his life. And if we look at his example of, of faith bringing him through. We look at the early church, and they were in fear for their lives. They were being pursued and martyred. And so fear has also been a big part of people's lives of faith uh, for a long time. COVID is also about power. Who is in power? Who has the authority to say what is right and what is wrong and, and, and who should do what? Uh, it, it has become a battle of power and it's, uh, it is a, a stressful to see this battle take place. And ultimately it's also a, a struggle of trust. Who do we trust? What voices can we listen to and find comfort in or good direction in? And what uh, voices are simply causing us to say, hey, I can't trust that. I, I, I don't feel like that, that that's true. This has been a crazy time for the church, for us in general as human beings. But for the church, it's been a crazy time for us as we battle with how do all these things fit together. This is not something that is going to get solved in one sermon on one Sunday morning. But this is something I think that uh, if we bring it up in a, in a simple and balanced way, we can manage this time together. And uh, 
you know, we have thought, oh, this is going to be two months. This is going to be a couple years. This is going to be forever. Who knows what this is going to be? Those are the big unknowns that we face. And I don't want to say it and I don't want to hear that. But if we can make our faith a priority in our lives, we can get through this. We can adapt and we can grow. And uh, just like everything that we see within uh, our lives of faith with what, with what God has told us, anything that happens in this world that God has created for us can be for our benefit. Anything. That's why we have scriptures that tell us that all things can work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Does it mean without challenges? No. Does it mean without pain and sadness? No. But it means that we can have a happy and fulfilled and peaceful uh, life of vitality in the midst of crazy circumstances. And so this is something that I think we'll need to be coming back to over and over and over again. I know I need it, and, and I'm sure that, uh, that you feel like that you need it as well. Hopefully we can... We can um, talk about it without feeling stressed that, oh, here we have to talk about this again. <laughs> uh, but I did want to share with you that I do feel, uh, I feel some, some confidence and inspiration coming out of sabbatical regarding uh, this pandemic. And I can say that, you know, I've been in places with, that's, I'm sure, where I'm sure you have, where it's been very dark and depressing and, and, and unknown. But we can get through this together. So I would like for us uh, to, uh, to look at uh, scripture that we have uh, for this morning. And the scripture comes to us from the book of James. And uh, in the book of James, we're going to be looking at uh, James chapter 1, verses 17 through 27. What I'm going to do with this text this morning is uh, I felt like that it, um, it, it informs us on uh, how we can do church and how we can, um, uh, how we can live this simple life that we're called to, these lives of faith. Uh, and let's see what this uh, first, um, uh, the first church, uh, the first generation of church had as their direction. James 1. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. There's a lot of change that takes place in life, lots of change. And in the last year and a half, we have experienced big changes. But one of the things that we can keep in our minds is that this life is a gift from God. God has given it to us, and God doesn't change. God is the one thing that we can hold on to no matter what happens. God is always going to be there for us and, and giving us life. The next verse says, In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creation and I think this is a a wonderful reminder to us that we're created by God's intentions God wants us to be here and to be alive and to live wonderful fulfilled lives and it's through his intention that becomes word that creates each and every one of us and that intention not only created us but we'll see a little bit later it also resides in us as well. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. This is wonderful advice, especially during the time that we're living today, because I think we are very quick to be angry. Anybody quick to be angry in the middle of this pandemic? <laughs> There's plenty to be angry about. And we like to, we all have different faces that we like to have as kind of the target of that anger. And, uh, the, you know, we have this, 
this monstrous worldwide thing causing stress and chaos in our lives. But what humans like to do is if we can just blame somebody, it's going to make us feel better. So all of this that's gone wrong is your fault or is your fault or is your fault. And that's usually how we deal with anger. If we're quick to anger, we can see that this does not produce God's righteousness. This does not bring about the best results. But we need to be slow to anger. It doesn't say don't be angry. The scripture doesn't tell us don't be angry. Anger is just going to be a part of life. I've heard anger described as unrealized expectations. If you have certain expectations in your life and suddenly they're ripped away or they're taken away or they're changed, first thing we do is get angry and get upset. And so it's a natural thing because our expectations are constantly throughout our lives going to be altered or changed. Anybody have an expectation that you had that has, uh, didn't come to pass or got changed? And how did it make you feel? Probably anger was somewhere in the midst there. So it's a natural thing. But what this tells us is to be slow to anger. And that means just kind of hold it in for a while and let the word of God that's in our hearts kind of get mixed in with it. Let all of our faith and all of our understanding about the truly good things about life get mixed in with that. Just kind of let it simmer and stew for a while. And what we can find is that when we can take that anger and when we're ready to take that anger and the energy from it and produce something that is God's righteousness or something positive within our lives, it can be a positive thing. Positive good things can come out of anger, but not quick anger. Quick anger just gets people hurt and makes people retaliate with quick anger. Uh, just imagine if we would take our time with our anger, what a different life uh, that, we, that we could have. And it also says to be slow to speak. How many know that it's very easy just to say what's on our mind? And oftentimes, we don't even know what's on our mind until we hear it come out of our mouth. That's some quick speaking, right? <laughs> We've got other ways of speaking now that usually has to do with a phone or a, or, a, or a keyboard at home. Has anybody ever seen someone who seems to be quick to speak in comments, expressing opinions and thoughts? And there is not a, uh, th there is an abundance of thoughts and opinions floating out there in the world for us today. But we're, we need also to be slow with the way that we speak as well. Same principle, holding those thoughts and feelings in, letting them ruminate with the things that are true, and, and then letting them come out when they need to. It will make a big difference in the way that we experience life. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. So this is the same word that created you. It is within you. It's alive within you right here and right now. The word of God is alive within you in your hearts. And our job is to listen to that word that's within our hearts and to do and to act on that word that's within our hearts. And there's a, if we look at these next few lines here, it's, it's kind of a funny picture. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they're like those who look at themselves in a mirror, for they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. So if, if, we, if we look at the word of God within our hearts, but we don't act on it and respond in our lives with it, we're just going to forget that it was there. It'll be like looking in the mirror and turning around and going to the car and be like, I know I looked in the mirror, but I'm not sure what I just saw. <laughs> Anybody, you know, you're getting ready for work or you're going to go out to the grocery store or something, just check yourself in the mirror. And then later on, you're like, did I check myself good enough? I don't know. So we need to, we need to act on things within us. Uh, th this is the, the example here. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, 
they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. So this perfect law, again, is this word of God within our hearts. That's the perfect law, the word that speaks to us, the living word of God within our hearts, the one that we respond to. And that law is called a law of freedom. If we can respond to the word of God within our hearts, we're going to find that we live lives of freedom. And when we don't respond to it, we'll find that uh, we, we find ourselves in bondage. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So this is the last uh, text that comes to us uh, from James, and it's talking about religion. Religion is our life of responding to the word of God that's within us. It's the habit of doing that over and over and over again throughout our lives. And if we can do this, what we will find ourselves doing is we'll find ourselves caring for those who are in the greatest need. The orphans and the widows in this time when it was written were those people that were on the fringes. They didn't have anyone to care for them. They didn't have any type of empowerment. They were completely dependent on the compassion of of other people. And so we'll find ourselves in this place where the things of this life that need to be tended to that may not seem important are ultimately the things that will give us life because that's what God would do uh, with his heart. And if we can do all these things, if we can keep our focus on the word within our hearts, if we can respond with faithfulness, then we will not be stained by all of the chaos around us, all of the things that can bring us down or misdirect us. We will be at a place Uh, where we have a fulfillment uh, in our lives. Let's take a moment and uh, let's reflect on this uh, word of God for us today.
Well, some announcements uh, for some things taking place uh, with our church. Uh, one is we're taking donations for the organization Care Bag, which provides hygiene uh, for people in St. Lucie County who do not have access to it, whether it be showers or hygiene products. So uh, you can make hygiene donations. Sisters in Faith is helping us to collect that and get that to Care Bag. And you can see more on the table out in the narthex. We do have Bible study every Thursday at 10 a.m. You're welcome to join either in person or online. And we do have our weekly church newsletter that will go out every Friday. You're welcome to subscribe to that if you haven't already. Uh, the email address to subscribe is office at faithchurchpsl.org. And uh, we also uh, have our prayer requests listed in uh, our prayer list listed in the newsletter. Uh, we will see you next Sunday for our worship service at 10 a.m., both in person and online. And this Saturday is the monthly meeting for Sisters in Faith uh, here at uh, 10 a.m. You're welcome to participate uh, in that. Happy birthday this week to Sh uh, Shirley DeAndrea at, uh, on August the 29th, uh, Madeline Joan Jirasi, August the 30th, and Sarah Lewis, also August 30th. Let's say happy birthday to those folks. And let's say happy anniversary to Mike and Karen Overly, August 31st. Congratulations to you guys. As we leave this shared time and space today, let's make a commitment to stay connected with one another. Let's dedicate our offerings for the mission that God has given us here at Faith Church. And let's enter into this new week with God's blessing. Let us pray. Living God, thank you for your gifts of life. Fragrant flowers, fruitful vines, singing creatures in our own lives, renewed in Christ. Let your grace infuse the gifts we offer with life-giving power for those in need. We thank you for blessings, uh, for blessing us with every perfect gift from above, freeing us to rise and live in the embrace of your love. We pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I guess I didn't welcome those who are joining online. My apologies. Welcome. <laughs> and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Uh, glad that you've been able <clears throat> to be a part of our service online today. And why don't we all stand here and our congregation will sing our closing song together. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh,